Hi guys, time for another shop vlog to get you updated on the goings around here at the Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal shop. This is vlog number 27 and here's what we're going to be talking about. Yep, it's going to be that interesting. So buckle up. Pete's back. As you know, I had to shut the shop down and send everyone home to hide from COVID-19. We thought it would be for three weeks. It lasted for 10. But on July 1st, Workshop Pete came back and we resumed some of the projects that had been on hold, particularly the giant built-in, which was starting to feel like the project that would never end. Well, it's finally done. And all the footage we took during the build can start becoming videos for you to watch. I'm not gonna do a detailed beginning to end video because it's a custom project that none of you will likely ever make. That's a point of contention among some folks. Most YouTube channels make videos showing them building a project from start to finish, and that's great. Lots of folks enjoy those videos, sometimes I do too. But if I'm not going to build that project myself, I'm less likely to watch it, even though I know I may learn something in the process. I'd rather just see the skill or the technique that's relevant to me and skip the rest of the project. And that's the thought process behind what we do on this channel. Sometimes people ask, why don't you ever build anything? We do build things on this channel, we just present it in a different way. Instead of making the video about a whole project, we break it down into individual tips or tutorials, separate videos discussing individual parts of a build that include lessons you can apply to the projects you do build. For example, if I made a video about this built-in, I'd have to rush through a dozen little lessons to make the length more manageable. And even if I took the time to explain those important lessons, much of it would just be lost because it's just too much information at once. Then, maybe a few months from now, you're building a vanity for your bathroom or some kitchen cabinets and you need some tips for choosing and installing European style hinges. You might remember I talked about that, but which project was it in? Was it a vanity project? A kitchen cabinet project? You may have to watch several videos before you remember it was that built-in project. And then you'd have to find that video and then skim through the whole thing to find the relevant information about hinges. Let's be realistic, it's not gonna happen. It's too much effort. I'd rather search for a specific video about the tip or the technique I'm interested in rather than having to find it within a larger project. So instead of making a whole video about a built-in you won't ever build, we'll do a tutorial about curve bending plywood to make the arch. We'll make another one about frameless cabinet construction. Maybe one about edge banding. We'll definitely make a tutorial about building divided glass doors. And yes, we'll make one about choosing and installing European style hinges. That's not to say we'll never or have never made a project video from start to finish. We're definitely gonna do some detailed project tutorials for the new website when it launches later this year. But this YouTube channel is about learning new things you can apply to your own work rather than just watching someone else work. So if you're one of those folks who ask in the comments, why don't you build anything? We are, we are making projects. It's just that we aren't presenting them as everyone else does. We're doing our own thing. And I think there's a place for that on YouTube. Speaking of small lessons you can glean from large projects, let's talk about the curved doors on this built-in. They had to follow the shape of the arch beneath them, and that was a little bit challenging. The plan was to make a rectangular door frame, as usual, then cut out the corner and replace it with a curved piece cut from a square of maple. That seemed simple enough, 
but cutting the curve and profiling it to match the door wasn't as easy as it looked. First, we made a simple circle jig. If you've never made one of these, it's just a scrap of quarter inch plywood screwed to the base of the router with a pivot point. Then we secured the first maple blank to a piece of MDF with some screws in a place where it wouldn't interfere with the cut. Using some fancy math, Pete figured out how far from the router bit the pivot point had to be to cut the radius we needed. Now since there were two to be cut, we didn't film the first one. We often do that to make sure we get it right the first time and then the video goes smoother when you film the second one. But as it turned out, we didn't film the second one of this either because it just didn't work out as planned. We found that the shape of the arch was not an even curve. It's an asymmetrical curve, which can't be cut with a simple router jig. So we ended up doing what we should have done in the first place. We traced it in place and then cut it out on the bandsaw. It took more time and more sanding to get both curves even and smooth, which is really important because these will stick out like a sore thumb if there's the slightest lump or dip in the shape, especially because the outer edge had to be profiled, which magnifies any flaws. The ends are coped on the router table just as any cabinet door rails would be, and they're glued in place. Then a rabbit's cut on the back to receive the glass panels. These little curved corners on the doors took most of the day to get right, but it's design details like this that make what would have otherwise been a boring cabinet into something unique and interesting. Every once in a while, you have to take a break and do some shop maintenance. Tune up your machines, check your blade alignment, just made a tutorial about that last week, wax the cast iron, that sort of thing. Personally, I'm not a fan of tool maintenance, but Pete used to maintain all the machines at a large shop in Brooklyn, and he's pretty good at it. So this week, I sent him to work on some things that I've been putting off for a long time. For example, the switch on our cabinet saw somehow lost the spring that keeps the paddle from vibrating and turning itself off when you're working. Sometimes I sit in my office in the back of the shop and I listen to someone using that table saw in the front and they get angrier and angrier as the saw keeps turning off on a mid cut. I have no idea where that little spring went or even how it came off, but it's nowhere to be found. So either had to install a swear jar or install a new switch. Fortunately, I had a new switch in a box that SawStop sent me about two years ago when I reported a sensor issue. You always get excellent service from SawStop. Not only did we replace the switch box, and inside it's basically mostly electronics that run the saw, but also the board and outlet that's inside the saw beneath the blade where the cartridge plugs in. That was tough to get at. I think it may have been easier to just remove the cast iron top. That's probably how they install it in the factory. But that would have meant taking off the fence, the sliding crosscut table, and the overarm dust collection. And that would have been a massive day-long pain in my butt. So I just made Pete wad his six-foot frame up and burrow inside the saw like an airplane mechanic. After that, we stalled a helical head in the jointer. Now I know what you're thinking. Don't you already have a helical head in your jointer? Yes and no. About three years ago, I put one in my six inch Delta jointer in the old shop. And I put one in my Delta planer. Then the Delta planer was replaced by a new DeWalt and Mustache Mike put a helical head in that. Then we moved into this new shop and I had more room, so I got a bigger stationary planer and Pete upgraded that to a helical head. And I also got an eight inch jointer and that needed a helical head but it's a new model and there wasn't a helical head available for it yet. At least not one of the new Lux cut ones and frankly I would rather buy the machine without the helical head in it because you can buy machines with the heads already installed and then order one from Lux cut because I think I get a much better quality head for the money. So anyway, we removed the straight knife head that was in the jointer and we shipped it off to Global Tooling via MyWoodcutters.com. So they measured it 
and they sent it back so I could reinstall it and use the machine for a while with the regular straight knives while they made the new LuxCut helical head to those specs, because this is a brand new machine, they'd never made one yet. That new head finally arrived just as the virus was shutting everything down, and that added a couple months to the wait. But now it's finally installed, and every machine in both the main shop and the small corner workshop has a helical head in it, and in my opinion, it is worth every penny. If you're thinking of a helical head, go to mywoodcutters.com. Stefan has the best price and the best service, hands down. And if you happen to order a Lux Cut helical head for a grizzly 8-inch parallelogram jointer, it was my head they measured to make it. So you're welcome. Years ago, I made a video about what I called rearrangeritis. It's a disease that makes you constantly rearrange your shot, usually to fit in more tools or to make better use of your limited space. When I moved into this new larger shop, I thought those days were over. I was wrong. I still move crap around all the time. Here we're moving the hand tool wall 30 inches to the right, and I'm not doing that just to be a jerk. I need some more room between the hand tools and the backdrop of the corner workshop so I can fit a jet engine in there. Stay tuned to find out what I mean by that. Speaking of the corner workshop, we're building something new for that, which you're definitely going to want to see. I'm calling it the One Wall Workshop. It's a compact solution for people who only have one wall in a standard garage for their woodworking tools because the dang kids' bikes and soccer crap take up the rest of the space. It's one of the reasons I have this little area set aside as a standalone corner workshop. We use it to come up with solutions for those in our audience, and I know there are a lot of you, that don't have a lot of space or fancy tools. This one wall workshop is just the beginning. You'll see. Well, that wraps things up for this shop vlog. Time to sit back and have yourself a cold one, because you earned it, my friend. MyWoodCutters.com is the sort of small business I like to support. Stefan is a great guy, and he can find you knives and cutters for almost any joiner, planer, shaper, or molding machine. And his are the best prices if you're planning to upgrade to a helical carbide cutter head. Please use the link below this video to check with him before you buy somewhere else. Some small businesses are just worth supporting. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe, and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up, or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.